The microclimate in any garden, even a small one, is fascinating and a really adventurous gardener will exploit it to the full. In this garden, I measured the temperatures this morning, all in the shade, and in the courtyard garden and this wall garden, the temperatures were on average six degrees centigrade, higher than on the north side, which is much more exposed. And in a tiny garden, you will often get temperature extremes of 10 degrees C. The rain shadow effect also comes into play. The other morning in mid-October, we had our first frost very early for the UK. And on my north side, I had quite a frost, but in the courtyard, my dahlias were absolutely fine. And my vegetables, my French beans, my runner beans and my courgettes, also on the north side, were absolutely fine. But that was probably because they're in raised beds and that higher positioning just meant they were out of the cooler, coldest temperatures, which are on the ground. The other thing with microclimate is of course sun and shade. So here you can see a shadow diagram which we've done for the dial for the whole house and garden and we've plotted this using SketchUp models so you can see what it's like at different times of year and on different elevations. Now that's obviously quite a lot of work to go to and we often go to doing that when we're doing planning applications which might adversely affect other properties or different parts of the properties so we can just show exactly how much extra shadow is being created. Now you might not want to go to all that trouble but you can just do a simple sketch up on a piece of paper, sketch it out and you can measure the, temp the sunlight the morning, lunchtime, afternoon and in the evening. And then, unless you're uh, living on at the equator, in which you'll get very, li different, very little difference in variation of shade, you then really need to do that throughout the year, spring, autumn, summer, winter. And then you can plot on where the shadows lies and you can get a pretty good idea. Now that might all sound too complicated and you might do what most gardeners do, and that is trial and error. And in a way, I think there's a lot to be said for that because on my north facing wall by the barn, which is about eight meters high, I grow amazing espalier pears and it's really productive. I also get Vabascum bombiciferae regularly seeding all along there and flowering profusely. And so you never quite know what will do well. In other areas, in heavy shade, dry shade, I've had acopanthus flowering beautifully, which is a plant which is meant to love full sun, but it obviously tolerates shade too. And when you're actually buying plants, you see a label that says full sun, and they say full sun means about six hours of sun a day. Now, back to the north facing barn wall, we are always asked on gardens question time, what climbers can I grow on a north facing wall? And actually, I find there's many. I love Hydrangea petiolaris, which is a self clinging climber. I love Hydrangea simaniae, another self clinging climber, but also evergreen. And then many roses do really well on the north facing wall. Things like Madame Alfred Carrier, I grow with its beautiful white flowers, Sir Paul Smith, a crimson Issa Rise. And in fact, most roses will grow on a north facing wall, but what they don't like is dry shade. So perhaps don't put them under a tree and if you are planting them against a shady wall, make sure that the rain shadow effect is not going to kick on you. So you might need to give them ex extra watering to get them established and to keep them flowering really well. We talk about rain shadow and I think most people know that it's not a great idea to plant something that likes moisture close to a wall, for example, close to the house because you've got the the rain shadow effect of the eaves of the house, for one thing, you've got the wall drawing the moisture away. But the same thing applies with something like a boundary fence. If you think about where most of our rain comes from, it comes from weather systems coming in from the Atlantic, so coming from the southwest. And that rain doesn't just fall straight down vertically. It actually is blown along by the wind. So if you've got a weather system coming in from the southwest, coming up against, well, in this case, my boundary fence, 
a lot of the rain will hit the south side of that, the neighbor's side, and run down that side. And you'd be surprised how little actually gets the other side of the fence uh, to drop on my bit of the garden on this side. It's, it's, it's exactly the same effect as um, when you look at a map of rainfall across the UK, soaking wet on western coasts, much, much drier when you go to the eastern side of the mountain. It's the same thing, but on a much smaller scale uh, within your garden. And, and it can make an enormous difference. You have to come a you know, decent distance away from the fence to get away from that rain shadow effect. Yeah, extraordinary. And do you, do you actually measure all these things? I know you have measured the difference temperature around your garden. And do you have a weather station? Do you measure the rainfall so you know what you've had? And do you have a Stevenson screen? I don't have a Stevenson screen, but I have a, a little automatic weather station. Um, and I've had those. I'm on my second one now because the first one I did eventually give up the ghost. Um, but I've had those for, for several years now. And, you know, they're... In the great scheme of things, relatively inexpensive. You can get a decent one for between 100 and 200 pounds, which will do absolutely everything for you. So there's all the sensors outside. Yeah. I've got a little computer reader, a little display here that's yeah. telling me at the moment it's 22 degrees. I've got a humidity of 53% outside. Uh, I've had zero rainfall so far, which has mm. been the story of this summer, of course. Um, mm. And you can take all those readings, feed them into your computer, or in this case, it goes to a third party website. And you can look back and see exactly what you've had over the last month, week, years, you know, however long you've actually had your station there. Yeah. And, it, and it just chugs along and it does its own, it does its own stuff. It's um, pretty much maintenance free, apart from changing the batteries perhaps once a year. They are fantastic little bits of kit and really quite accurate as well, particularly the rainfall side of things. Ah, interesting. So they might well be worth getting. Yeah, with with the rainfall, you often wonder what you have. And I have sort of indicators, are the sheep, sheep troughs empty or full? And that gives me a, yes, a yes, rough yeah. idea. Yeah. And if I am irrigating, I usually put a tray out to measure how much water a sprinkler is applied to a certain area. So come and have a look at my sitting area, which is on the north side of the building. As Peter has pointed out, the microclimate varies even in quite a small garden. Um, and we want to learn how to moderate it. So I brought you to this area because this is a north facing sitting out area. I think north facing spaces have a very bad press. But for us with just a single story building, the kitchen is the room that we live in. So to have the sitting area just outside the kitchen is hugely important. It means we use it a lot. And even now in September, it's got a fair amount of sun in it, on it when the sun's out. But further along where the building is higher, obviously we get slightly less sun. So don't be put off by a north facing space. As you can see, we've got the plumbagos, I've got agapanthus, a beautiful, and they're all flowering perfectly. And what we love about it is you can actually see the sun coming in the evening across from the west, across the meadow, and that looks spectacular. And in the morning, obviously, it goes the other way from the east across the meadow. So don't discard a north facing environment. The light is quite special there. It's much softer, much calmer than a really bright south facing light. So whites look particularly good against it. Um, and if you talk to needleworkers or fine artists, they love rooms with a north facing light because it has a particular quality. Um, so we've got roses that flower all summer long against the north facing wall and many roses will actually tolerate a north facing wall. What they don't like is heavy shade under trees and there they have a double whammy. They have little water and little sun, but on a wall, many of them will do very well. I noticed my mum had a magnolia grandiflora on the north wall and the south wall. On the south wall, it flowered much earlier. But on the north wall, although it came out later, the blooms did last much better because they weren't hit by that blistering hot sunlight. So I love north walls and I think more people should do so. Now, as far as south facing walls are, I'll take you to my south facing area in a minute, but that is obviously very, very warm. Um, and it really does pick up the sun's rays. And what is interesting is if you have um, a 600 millimeter wide or two foot stonework wall, it will, uh, it will protect you, absorb the same amount of heat or it give you the same amount of insulation 
as a nine inch brick wall because of thermal qualities or as three quarters of inches of polystyrene, expanded polystyrene, that will give you the same amount of insulation as a two foot stone wall. So that's a really useful factor to know when you're trying to insulate your greenhouse or whatever. But um, south facing walls were obviously used m m hugely in old days when they had wall gardens and they actually had chimneys coming up through the walls so that they could light them in the winter and they could really produce early crops and um, more tender crops by actually heating the wall. So they are very useful spaces. Um, then as far as west facing aspects for gardens or west facing walls, um, some people really love them and a cousin of mine who's got a fabulous house and garden says he actually wouldn't mind moving to a west facing garden because most of us come home from work at night and that's when we sit out in the garden and so you want the sunlight in the evening. Conversely, if you've got an east facing garden, you've got the sun in the morning. So you need to get to know your garden, know where the warm parts are, the sheltered parts are, um, the bits that you can exploit for different factors. So this is my south facing wall and I love it because it gives me the opportunity to enjoy some plants that might not tolerate the colder conditions. A lot of them are on the threshold. I've got this Buddha's hand, this lovely citrus plant which you use um, for the beautiful juices that it creates, that it gives you. Um, I've got another citrus there. I've got a pomegranate which is starting to fruit there. I've got my lemon verbena which I regularly use for my tea. Um, and I just try out all different things that people say are tender and you can't grow in this country. And often in this situation, they actually can tolerate quite well. And then if I want to go one step further, I can either bring them into a, a, a greenhouse in the winter where I keep it above freezing, or I can just pop, pop fleece over them in the evenings when frost is forecast. And that is amazing. That really does help get them through those colder periods and it saves lugging them around. So if you've got a south facing wall, really use it. Don't forget you've got the heat from the sun, plus this wall will give off heat at night and that will make the actual temperatures around here significantly higher than it will do just four or five meters over there.